All right, well, grab your Bibles now, please, and open with me to Romans chapter 4, verse 13 through 25. Two weeks ago, we looked at justified by faith, or declared righteous, from the end of Romans chapter 3. Of course, the letter of Romans is Paul's grand thesis statement on the doctrine of justification by faith, which he explained explains so clearly and precisely at the end of Romans chapter 3. After initially laying the groundwork that the whole world is guilty, Romans chapter 3, right at the end, two weeks ago, we looked at justified by faith. Then last week, we looked at justified by faith illustrated. As Paul had made the, the statement that the, the gospel was witnessed by the law and the prophets, And if that would be the case, you would think he'd have at least one Old Testament example. And he brought two, Abraham and David. But Abraham more so. And now today we consider justified by faith tested. Also from the life of Abraham, we're still in the middle of this illustration, you could say. But we see how this promise to Abraham was indeed greatly tested. The Lord did not fulfill his promise to Abraham immediately. Abraham had to wait for it. There was a lot of doubt along the way. Although Abraham was the father of faith, he did not have perfect faith and wavered at times. But as we see in our text today, the more dire the situation grew, the stronger Abraham's faith grew. And so if if the analogy is illustrating If Abraham's life is illustrating the doctrine of justification by faith, meaning I'm right with God by my faith, there are many times in our lives as believers that is tested. We we doubt our eternal security, and, and maybe that doubt arises primarily because of our own weakness or continued sinfulness or struggles as a Christian. And if all is right... Why am I like this? (laughs) And so can we resolve to have our confidence be where it ought to be in the gospel and not in our works? So that's our passage today before us. Let's read it then pray and study it. What do you say? Romans chapter 3 verses 13 through 25. Sorry, Romans 4. I misspoke. Romans chapter 4, verse 13 through 25. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure, certain, or guaranteed to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. That is God. And what does God do? Who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And Abraham there in verse 18, being contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, although it was already dead and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what God had promised, God was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Then verse 20, 23, this is no mere history lesson. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, 
but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe on him who raised up our Lord Jesus from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Heavenly Father, it is our dear and and holy, high privilege uh, to be able to study your word this day, to be able to consider you and your faithfulness. Lord, in light of our own weakness and our own inability, you remain faithful. And Lord, the promise unto everlasting life and justification by by grace uh, through faith is certainly our confident hope in you and in you alone. And Lord, oftentimes when that is tested and there's bewilderment on our end, uh, longing, desire, and, and hope for that fulfillment of righteousness on our end, and Lord, when we are met with obstacles and challenges of this life, namely our own sinfulness and fallenness, even as we await that promise, Lord, your word remains true. And salvation remains sure and a guarantee for all who would believe in Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. So bless our time, our study now in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There are different kinds of laughter. There's the uh, courtesy laugh. There's the deep belly laugh. There's the, wait, are they laughing at me or are they laughing with me laugh kind of question. Um, There's the scoffing or mocking laugh. Uh, There's there's the laughable laugh where we might laugh because somebody made a statement that is just so outrageous, so unbelievable, that it's just laughable. We might even laugh like as if that could ever happen. Sarah laughed like that once, standing in a tent door, 89 years old. The Lord said to Abraham, your wife, I'm going to return this time next year, and your wife will have a son. And Sarah laughed. And then the Lord said to Abraham, hey, why did your wife laugh? And then he said to Sarah, is anything too hard for me? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, no, you laughed. (laughs) Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Well, the Lord would visit Sarah as he had spoken and do for Sarah as he would, as he had said, and she would indeed bear a child in Abraham's old age. Abraham would be a hundred and she would be 90. And then Sarah would really laugh, which brings me to another kind of laughter. There's the laughter that is experienced by the human heart when a long-awaited desire is finally fulfilled. It's a laughter that might even cause somebody to to put their hand over their mouth because they have such exuberant joy that their laughter might even turn to crying where there's such an unbelief that this thing that I, I had hoped for but never actually never thought actually would ever happen has now happened to me. And there is such deep elated joy that I don't even know how I can contain myself. That kind of laughter. And that's the laughter with which Sarah laughed the second time. In fact, she named her son laughter. Isaac means laughter. And she said... Who would have known that Sarah would bear a child? And she said, God has made me laugh. Human desire ranges from a desire to have a sports team win, to have a desire to be respected or honored in our peer group, to have financial stability and success, to have intimate relate, to desire to have intimate relationships. Uh, ultimately, our, our greatest human desire is to stay alive and have those that we love stay alive. But of all the range of human emotion and desire, one of the greatest human desires that a woman would ever have is to have a baby. And it ranges right up there at the top. 
especially a, a woman who's married and longing for children, when she finds herself in a place of barrenness and inability, it can be one of the hardest pains this world ever knows. For the child of God, I believe our highest desire is to be righteous and to please the Lord. And when there is a, could we call it a barrenness or an impotence or a fruitlessness in that area as a child of God, when there is a desire to please the Lord and walk fully with him, to honor him in all that we do, when that desire goes unfulfilled and all we are aware of is our own sinfulness and fallenness, it can create a deep heartache like no other. I believe this is where this text off offers us a healing balm. And the Lord uses an analogy of a barren woman who longs so much, not only for a child, but also for, for, for the fulfillment of an entire promise that through this child of hers, the whole world would be blessed and descendants upon descendants upon descendants. And it is here related to the doctrine of justification by faith, where we can be made righteous by our confident hope in the Lord. A hope that is often tested, but is sure in the gospel. Verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham and his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Oh my goodness. Verse 13, the promise that he would be the heir of the world, that's phenomenal. Did you see that? Or did I just read it and you didn't pay any attention? The heir of the world, like that needs a little bit of explanation, doesn't it? Like Abraham had a promise that he was going to be an inheritor of the planet, of all that is there. And how did that, how did that arise? Well, God had made him a promise that through him and through his progeny, through his descendants, the whole entire world would be blessed, that his descendants would be like sand by the seashore, stars of the heaven and multitude. And so that, that, that he would be that very heir of the world. And that heir did not come to Abraham in regard to his own ability. Um, it was not through the law or through Abraham fulfilling the Mosaic law, which was not even written yet, but through the righteousness of faith. And so I would like to attempt to do this quickly, and I don't do anything quickly from the pulpit, and I apologize to you in advance for that. But can I quickly try to uh, explain, just using a few verses, what we're talking about when we're talking about Abraham as the heir, the promise to him and his seed. So it says to Abraham and his seed, we have these promises made, okay? Um, so, so first off, when we would consider that this promise that is mentioned in verse 13, the promise that he would be the heir of the world, what is that, that promise? What is the promise God gave to Abraham? We could look at Galatians 3, 8, and 9, and, and it says in the scripture, foreseeing that God would just Justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So, what could we say from this verse is the promise that God gave to Abraham? It's none other than the gospel. In fact, Abraham's not just an analogy of how we believe the gospel, the promise that God gave to Abraham beforehand was the gospel. And we're actually believing the same promise that Abraham believed because Abraham believed that through his descendants and even descendants singular would come the Messiah through whom the whole world would be blessed. So we're actually believing the same promise that Abraham believed. And what was that promise? It was the gospel. So then Galatians 3, 9 says, then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Paul puts it succinctly in Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise, that was the promise to Abraham, in Christ, again, through the gospel. And so there was this promise that the whole world could be saved through the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. Galatians 3.14 tells us that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, those are all the other nations, us included as Americans, uh, uh, might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
And so when God selected the Jewish nation and Abraham specifically, he said, through your seed will come a Messiah through whom all those who believe will also be considered your descendants and they'll all be blessed through this hope. And so Galatians 3.29 reminds us, or uh, sorry, Galatians 3.16 reminds us that Abraham also, although he is father of many nations, had primarily one seed through whom this promise would come. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say seeds as as many, but as one seed, singular, your seed who is Christ. Meaning that, that Abraham, the promise that God would bless the whole world through Abraham's descendants, the original Hebrew word that was used is a singular word that would be one descendant of Abraham who would be more important than all the other descendants of Abraham. And that would be Jesus, born a Jew, a son of Abraham. And, and so it is that Jesus is the Savior of the whole world in Galatians 3.29. And, and so now, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, plural, because we've believed in his seed, singular, <laughs> and heirs according to the promise, or the promise of the gospel. And so what we could say is that Abraham believed the gospel, that there would be blessing through one of his descendants, Jesus, who would live a sinless life, die, rise again, and offer justification by faith to all who, to all who believe. As descendants of Abraham, we believe in the self-same promise. Now we draw our attention back to Romans chapter 4. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to explain that. Uh, and and I just would look at the simple logical question that is being asked now by Abraham. This promise that he'd be heir of the world or the blessing of the world would come through him. It, you know, it didn't come through uh, the law, but rather through the righteousness of faith. And then quite, logic, quite logically so, verse, verse 14. For if those who are of the law are heirs, well, then faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Paul simply says, if the law, which came 430 years after the promise to Abraham, was the means of salvation, well, then the promise is of no effect. It'd be similar to somebody saying, hey, you've won a free, all-expense-paid trip to this you know, wonderful vacation land. And then you, as you look into it, they say, now this is all you have to do. Fill out this form, pay this tax, this fee, oh, get your own airplane ticket and, and jump through all these hoops. And you're like, you're extracting far more than what I thought free meant, you know? And this is actually, I mean, quite an expensive endeavor after all. There's actually full outfits that specialize in something along those lines. Anyway, here's the deal. If somebody makes a promise and they say, this is something you're, you'll have for free, and then afterward, they say, but by the way, you need to do this, 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 and this. It's no longer free. And so the promise that Abraham would be the heir of the world was not through the law, which would have come many years after, but it was through the righteousness that comes from faith. It, because if those who are of the law are heirs of this promise, well, then there's no need for faith. Faith is made void, and the promise is made empty. It's of no effect. And, and, and that's also because the law brings about wrath. That's the only thing that the law can do. It leaves us guilty. Cue the first three chapters of Romans that we just looked at. Guilty, 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 the world is. And, and, and where there's no law, there is no transgression. This doesn't mean where there's no law, there's no sin. Yes, sin reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam or or, and then, but the law heightened sin or our, our sinful awareness. The simple point is this. We are saved by grace. Not by, and it's by promise. On one hand, you have law, wrath, judgment, duty. On the other hand, you have grace and faith and promise and blessing. And they do not mix. And so, Paul brings that up so he can say in verse 16, therefore, here's my conclusion, it is a faith that it might be according to grace. It's not by law so that it would be according to works, but rather it is by faith there so that it might be according to grace. 
And because it's according to grace, which is a free gift, salvation, we read, because of that, the promise can be sure to all the seed. And I like that. Because it's of grace, we can be certain. The word sure means to have a guarantee. If your salvation depended upon your works, there's no way you could be guaranteed everlasting life. In fact, you could pretty much be assured that you're not guaranteed it or guaranteed that you won't have it. If your salvation today depends upon your track record, past, present, or even future, there's no way that you could be a sure recipient of this promise. But if salvation is by faith, God's free gift of grace through his son, and it's received by faith, by believing God's promise, then you can be sure, and it can be sure to, to all the seed. This is how our oldest son, Stephen, was saved. For years, we had shared the gospel with him, read Bible stories. He knew it. He loved Jesus and draw pictures of Jesus on the cross and, and would come to church with us. But in his adolescent years, he had a real concerned conscience and no assurance of his salvation. We'd receive a knock on the door several evenings. Stephen, what's the matter? I don't know if I'm going to heaven or not. In his own sinfulness, in, in his own disobedience to his parents, wherever else his own rebellious heart lapped up to his shore, gave him great concern about standing before a holy God. And he just did not know whether his works measured up. And so we'd share the gospel with him, but he still really couldn't hear the gospel. Didn't really hear it. And we'd pray with him, and we'd essentially pray the sinner's prayer again with him. And remind him that as, as he's confessed his sin, that he's forgiven. And so one day on the way home from church, we're talking again. And he's bringing this back up. I think he was 12 or so. And he said, I said, Stephen, if I told you I'd pick you up from school at a certain time, would you believe that I'd be there? Yes, he said then why not take God at his word? He's promised to forgive your sins if you would ask him. Christ died for them and rose again. And he looked at me and he said, you mean all I have to do is believe? <laughs> Pretty much. Like we've been saying that for a very long time, son. But you've not heard it yet. You and, and so it's still a part of his testimony today. And now he says it a little bit more. He's serving along with his wife as a youth pastor at Calvary Heritage in Brookings. And Cheryl and I are so blessed by him, that ministry there. But you'll hear him talk about his testimony today about confidence in the Lord. And he says, there was a day I just realized I had to put all of my confidence in my hope in the gospel. And he, and he'll say it, he who promised to forgive my sins will never fail me. That's where my hope is. And that's where Abraham's hope was. And I'll also draw your attention there in verse 16 to a small little but very important word where it says, because it's to get context, therefore it is of faith so that it could be according to grace so that the promise might be sure, certain, guaranteed to, listen, all the seed. Now all means all, and that's all all means. And if it were by works, there'd be some of you that would not be able to believe the promise very easily. Because you, quite frankly, don't sin as you see other Christians sin. And in your mind, other Christians just simply struggle with the sins of maybe ingratitude or occasionally a little unkindness toward their spouse maybe. 
shortness with their kids. But your sin is, well, that's, it's been a real struggle. And if it were up to us pulling out all of those things that you don't want anybody ever to know about, you say, I don't know if I can have confidence that my sins are forgiven, saying they're worse than other men's sins. Now, if you're on the other side of that, that coin, this message is not for you. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men. <laughs> but if you're a God be merciful to me, a sinner, can I, kind of man, can I say it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise would be sure, a guarantee to all the seed, and that includes you. And if you've trusted in Christ for your salvation, your sins are paid full and final, past, present, and future. This is the faith of our father Abraham, who believed a promise even when there was no earthly evidence, physical evidence that it was being fulfilled. The promise would be sure to all the seed there in verse 16. Not only to those who are of the law or Jewish men and women, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. In this way, following Abraham's faith, we become sons of Abraham. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And so Abraham believed what kind of God? He believed in a God, there in verse 17, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So Abraham believed in a promise which we've already established is ultimately the promise of the gospel. And he believed in this promise, although there was no physical evidence, this promise had to begin with his wife Sarah having a son. And the years are ticking on. And in order for his wife, in order for there to be a future Messiah through whom the whole world would be blessed, it has to begin with Sarah having a son. And there was no physical evidence at that time that that could ever possibly happen. And so how could Abraham ever be declared righteous before his God if that didn't occur? But nonetheless, he believed in a God who did those two things I mentioned at the end of verse 17, a God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Generally speaking, God gives life to the dead. He's the creator of life. He spoke life into existence. And because Jesus rose again from the dead, he has conquered death and he has victory over death. He can call Lazarus out of the tomb. He can give life to dead sinners, those that are dead in trespasses and sin. The Lord gives life to the dead. Generally speaking also, the Lord calls those things into existence that do not exist. Again, at creation, ex nihilo, God created out of nothing. He's the only one who can do that. We can take what God has already created and form it into something else, but none of us can create out of nothing, taking thin air and making something out of it. On the contrary, and then more specifically, Abraham believed God who gives life to the dead, the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was barren, and now he was old. And between his impotence and her barrenness, there was a deadness and an inability to have children that they were very much aware of. And Abraham believed that God could actually bring life out of that. And then even later on, he believed that after Isaac was born, get this, when God asked him to raise the knife and take Isaac's life as a sacrifice, the book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham actually believed that even as he was about to kill his son, that God was going to bring the promise through his son. And that, so the only Logical conclusion is that God was going to raise him from the dead. Abraham was going to kill Isaac, believing in a resurrection from the dead. Amazing. God gives life to the dead. This is where Abraham's faith had come to. And God who creates something out of nothing. Where do babies come from? It's not the stork. It's God who brings life out of nothing and even out of an impotent man and a dead womb. And, and, and Abraham believed that 
Well, God can do anything he wants because he's in control of the entire place. And it was because of that in verse 18, when Abraham was contrary to hope, he in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations. So even when Abraham, as the years were wearing on and the situation becoming more dire and the hope was seemingly being dashed, what kind of phrase is this? Well, we were hoping. Oh man, can you hear the heartache of it? The men on the road to Emmaus said that about Jesus after he had been crucified. We were hoping he was going to save us. Hope in itself is hoping what you can't see. But when hope is dashed, when there is no hope, no more hope, all hope is lost. Oh, what a place. That's where Abraham was, contrary to hope, but he in hope believed. In fact, his faith helped him with his hopelessness. Or you could say his faith pulled his hope through. What's the difference between hope and faith? How would you answer that? What's the difference between hope and faith? They both have to deal with what you cannot see. Hope is merely longing desire. That's what hope is. I have a longing desire for what I cannot see. Faith is confident trust in what I cannot see that it will take place. Faith pulls hope through. Faith revives hope. An analogy would help. A man has a hope to be home with his family. He's traveling through a winter storm on a horse-drawn buggy, and he comes up to the frozen river. Hope is to be home with his family before the storm gets worse. Now he comes up to a frozen river. Faith says, It's been this cold for this period of time. Although I cannot measure the depth of the ice, I am going to confidently ride my horse and buggy over this frozen river to satisfy my hope of being home with my family. And so he does. Whereas another man in that self-same situation given over to fear and not faith and uncertainty about the solidity of the river peels back and so his hope is not realized by a lack of confident trust. And so the Lord says that our hope is realized through faith. Back to human desire, Abraham's hope was, and Sarah's hope to have a child through whom the world blessing would come. They had the confidently faith and faith move forward. If your, hope, if your hope and your desire today is righteousness by faith, to be righteous, to please the Lord, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, can I remind you that through the work of Jesus Christ, you will be filled. The Lord is the one who makes us righteous. He completes the good work. Galatians 5.5 5 tells us, for through the Spirit, we eagerly wait for the hope of, of righteousness by faith. We eagerly hope for righteousness. I might not see myself as righteous, and there's a lot of evidence in my life that I'm, I'm anything but righteous, but oh God, my longing desire is to please you, and my hope is to stand before you present without, without spot, without blemish. So how am I going to realize that full and final hope? Faith, full confident trust in Christ and the gospel. And it revives joy in our hearts, hope does. Romans 15, 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in what? Believing through your faith, through your confident hope in Christ. May your hope revive. Through your confident faith in Christ, may your hope revive that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you need fresh hope today. Fresh hope that your longing desire to be like Christ will indeed be fulfilled. And let that hope be revived as you attach yourself again to the gospel. This is exactly what Abraham did in verse 19, where it says he was not weak in faith, and, and, and he did not consider his own body. And since his body was already dead and the deadness of Sarah's womb, 
Then now if you have a, a version other than the old King James or the new King James version, uh, your, your Bible might say the exact opposite where it says, uh, and Abraham not being weak in faith, he did consider his own body or he considered his own body already dead. And so this is one of the spots where the Greek manuscripts actually differ. Uh, some say Abraham did not consider his body. Others say he did consider his own body. But the point is really the same. One is saying that Abraham uh, did, not consider the, did not consider his body as something that should hinder him from believing. And the other one was saying that he did consider his own body that it was completely dead and it was, and it was irrelevant. So to say that um, to not consider, so on one hand, you have Abraham saying that he did not consider his dead body as a relevant fact, or on the other one, you have Abraham considered his body as an irrelevant fact, <laughs> it's the same either way. Abraham saying, this is what my body says. Who cares? This is what God said. Yeah, I'm about 100. And Sarah's 90. And even when she was younger, she was barren. And the book of Genesis helps us here by just simply telling us that Sarah was past the age of childbearing. She had gone through menopause. She was no longer ovulating. She was physically no longer able to have children. But when she was younger and healthier and whole... Even then she wasn't able to have children. So now here's a barren woman who's gone through menopause. So she's doubly dead. And Abraham's as good as dead. The dude's 100. And so we have deadness all over it. But the Lord promised through Sarah, your seed will come. And so Abraham was not weak in faith, but rather, verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So he did not waver at God's promise. He did not allow his own shortcomings, impotency, failures, fruitlessness, uh, barrenness to keep him from believing God's promise. In fact, the phrase in the Greek where it says strengthened in faith means that Abraham the more dire the situation became, the stronger his faith became. And Abraham at times would say, let Eliezer live before you, or that Ishmael would live, live before you. And Isaac, and the Lord said, no, and Sarah, your seed. Sarah, your wife, will have a son, and then Isaac, your seed, will be called. And so that's exactly where Abraham went. And it brought glory to God. He gave glory to God in the di this dire situation. Now, I am all for my good works bringing the Lord glory. We all love Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. 1 Corinthians, uh, what is it, 10, 31. And, and whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, we are called to bring the Lord glory. And we love to bring the Lord glory through our good works. Men might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But there is another way that God is glorified in our life. And you know this, right? That when we absolutely cannot and when we absolutely fail and when through our own fallenness we fall again and we sin again and we come back to the cross and our tendency is, Lord, I'm just going to, I can't pray because I'm so sinful. I'm just going to fill a whole week full of good works and then next week I'll show the Lord I really mean it and then he'll accept me back and we say no and so we just, and that's, the Lord's like, that'll never work. And so then we come to the spot and we say, Lord, all the evidences around me are stacked against me and I'm not feeling very justified, righteous right now. And, and, and in my own fallenness, I'm in need of you. And this is why my track record says, but I'm going to believe your word and I'm going, to, I'm going to believe that one day you're going to present me faultless before your throne with exceeding joy, just as you have said. And I'm going to camp on that and I'm going to rejoice right here in that. And the Lord says... He receives glory from that. As we come again to him 
And then this amazing thing happens is Holy Spirit washes us clean and he actually enables us to live a godly life that we could never have done if we just tried to do it ourselves. It is true. It's the gospel. And God is glorified in the gospel. And God is glorified when a sinner says, I've sinned and I need a savior. I mean, like I really need a savior and I choose to believe your faithfulness over my unfaithfulness. And the Lord says, okay, I have a plan. How about Psalm 50 verse 15? You call upon me in the day of trouble. I will answer you and then you will glorify me. How about we make salvation about me and not about you? And that's how the Lord is glorified. And it's how he's magnified. And so Abraham in verse 21, he was fully convinced that what God had promised, God was able to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham became fully convinced that what God had promised, God was able to perform. I love what Martin Luther says here. And I've quoted this many times, but you... I've quoted this so many times, you should be able to quote it by now. And if you can quote it by now, I've done my duty. (laughs) Martin Luther said, the next time the devil throws your sins in your face and tells you that you deserve death and hell, well, then just say, what of it? I admit that I'm a sinner and I deserve death and hell, but I know one who suffered and made satisfaction in my place. His name is Jesus Christ, and where he is there, I will be also. We are not saved by works. We have no confidence in ourselves. We're saved by grace, and our confidence is in him who justifies the ungodly. Sandy Adams said, God's acceptance depends not on our performance, but on our faith in his promise. Abraham acted as if the preposterous was possible. It is easy to believe when we see how God might work it out, but real faith believes against all odds. Faith in the infeasible Saving faith takes God at his word that he can create new life in me. End quote. Sandy Adams, love it. I believe it. I believe God is able to do for me exactly what he's proven and said he would. I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. And so it was not written for his sake alone. Verse 23 tells us this is no mere history lesson. It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe on him. Oh, can I say that again? It shall be what? Faith shall be imputed to us for righteousness to to us who believe, listen, in him. And that's God who did what? Who raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who raised Jesus from the dead and will raise us up with him who, verse 5, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised for our justification. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. But Jesus died for my offenses. He was bruised for my iniquities, wounded wounded for my iniquities, bruised for my transgressions. The chastisement for my peace upon him, by his stripes I'm healed, right? That's what we we say. And as I believe in that, I am... The Lord looks at that faith of mine, of yours, that confidence in Christ, and credits it to our account for righteousness. This is no mere history lesson. This is for all of us. And he was raised from the dead for our justification for us to be declared righteous. What a glorious truth that we have. A Lord who's rescued us from our own sin and sinfulness and has made everlasting promises to us that we might have assurance of our salvation through the finished and final work of Jesus on the cross. Can I ask uh, you to do yourself a favor now and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Genesis chapter 21.
Genesis 21, when the promise would finally be fulfilled. To Abraham and to Sarah, verse 1, Genesis 21, 1. And I love it. And the Lord visited Sarah, hey, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Put your name there and the promises of the gospel that if we confess our sin, he's faithful, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to present us before his throne with exceeding joy, right and righteous and without spot and blemish. You believe that promise. There will be a day that you'll awaken glory and this word will be spoken over you. And the Lord visited at you as he had said and the Lord did for you as he had spoken and all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen and then verse 2 for Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him and Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him whom Sarah born to him Isaac Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh. Oh, that kind of laughter, that exuberant joy of this lifelong desire now fulfilled and all she could do was laugh. And all who heard would laugh with her, she said, and so she, she, uh, she also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, for I have borne him a son in his old age. And I like that, how Sarah says Abraham was old. She doesn't men- mention anything about her age. <laughs> she just had an old husband is all she knew. <laughs> Psalm 126 Verses 1 through 3 in conclusion. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Let's stand for a last song. Father, you've given us exceedingly great and precious promises by which we can escape the carnality of this world through lust, by which we can have present-day hope and future glory, And we trust in you, the giver of the greatest and best promises, and ultimately the promise of the gospel, of which we've been all partakers by faith. As we go out, let us go out with joy and rejoicing, confident in you and in your full and finished work at Calvary. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.